So, um, well, welcome to Brain Hope Reality, PTSD, not PTSI. Uh, our next episode, we have a very special guest today. Uh, she's an amazing nutritionist and fitness guru. Uh, she also knows a lot about PTSD and ketones and all those things. So I'm looking forward to learning tons from that. We are going to be using this. I'll be starting to use this soon. Yeah. Ketones, we can touch on that. It's, they need to sponsor me already. I rub them so much. Oh, perfect. They're not even sponsored. So I just like them. They should be sponsored. Well, it's good. They should be. Exactly. Anyway, <laughs> with that, Rachel, you're on. Please tell us who you are and what you've been doing in the last five, ten years. Five, ten years. Um, More or less you, whatever yeah, you like. Yeah. Besides well, writing books and saving lives. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me to come on your podcast. And it's actually interesting how um, I ended up here and in this line of working on the nervous system and everything that you do with PTSD because my background originally came from bodybuilding and fitness. That was really my first love. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> um, and I went to Baylor for nutrition science and dietetics, and my whole life was really revolving around helping people achieve incredible aesthetic outcomes. I competed in bodybuilding for three years back to back, and it was my first love because I grew up as a very uh, insecure little girl, very, very shy. And fitness for me really gave me that uh, sense of confidence that I found. So I got into bodybuilding, competed in it for three years, and... I was really good at it. I was winning a lot of shows, but it was shortly after that that I started to struggle with a lot of my own health issues. I started to struggle with chronic gut issues where I'd look six months pregnant at the end of every single day. I was struggling with hormone issues. My thyroid completely plummeted, so I was put on thyroid medication, and this was when I started to seek help from. How long ago was that, do you think? Uh, this was 2015. So, Got it. so nine years ago. About nine years ago, yeah. So what was happening 10 years ago was me into fitness and starting to develop a lot of these health issues, right? And I had yet to do a lot of the uh, healing work on myself yet. So you know, we'll dive into a little bit of the root cause because that's really what my work revolves around is helping people get to the root cause of their health issues. Right. But um, to kind of shorten my story, I ended up going from physician to physician, doctor to doctor. I was passed around. I was put on five plus medications. Um, I was on an antidepressant that I was actually put on when I was 15 years old, struggling a lot with depressive symptoms. I was bullied a lot as a kid, but now I was on five medications, thyroid medications, birth control. I was on an antidepressant. I was on laxatives so I could just go to the restroom because the motility in my gut had completely come to a halt. And they even went to the Mayo Clinic, they did a bunch of scans, they did all of their testing, and I was really just given a diagnosis of IBS, and I was sent on my way. And it was shortly after that, they sent me to a colorectal surgeon where they suggested the removal of my entire large intestine because of the dysmotility that oh, I wow. was struggling with. It's like a lovely procedure. <laughs> lovely procedure, right? Mm -hmm. um, I used to do those as a general you surgeon. <laughs> you really? You did col colectomies? Yeah, and probably for a lot of people with um, ulcerative colitis, right? And that and also cancer and, and con cancer, uh, of course. polyps and also diverticulosis was the most common case for us. Yeah. yeah, which is interesting. We could talk about how that's connected. Yeah, partial, partial, partial complete. Yeah. Complete. <clears throat> yeah. 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 For me, sigmoid, my gut wasn't damaged at all looking at it. It just was severe dysmotility that I was struggling with. Right, so you had a functional disorder. I had a functional disorder. Which is, clinicians are not so good at that. Not so great at that. Yeah. Cancer, straightforward. Yeah. Cut it out and move on. Yes, exactly. Functional disorder, fix the function. No, it comes to a lot of these. Plus chronic. being a young woman with IBS, doesn't everybody have that? Yes, uh, very common in women. Uh, right. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you my perspective. I'm curious to why you think it is in women more than men. I think um, definitely the cyclic nature of their hormones can play a bit of a role. Um, oh, but, of course. Yeah. But I'm, I'll tell you my you perspective. Yeah. I have a very odd perspective. So my particular expertise is sympathetic nervous system. Yes. So before I got into PTSD ward, uh, I was looking at 
published papers. So I was trying to understand, I was trying to write an article or understand, like my wife said, so stellate, thing I do, which is reset sympathetic nervous system works for pain. True. Like you saw a guy sitting out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, half flashes. It works for half flashes. And then start, uh, start using it for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And my wife said, it can't work for everything. You're so full of shit. And I was like, um, no, it does work. So she has a biochemistry degree. So I actually wrote an article explaining to her why it works. So I published it in 2009. Mm -hmm. So the commonality is sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. So Makes then sense. I was trying to understand. So as I was doing more research, it turns out if a woman has the same trauma as a man, the chance to deal with PTSD in women is twice as high. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what the hell, why would that be? So it seems like women have a more sensitive sympathetic nervous system. That makes sense. So it's easier to that. induce, yeah. right? So if you look at that from my perspective, so if you think about when you're scared, what happens to your gut? It goes to sleep, mm -hmm. right? So if your sympathetic is more active, so women yeah. are more sensitive to that and yeah. fibromyalgia and all those lovely things. And that, that actually makes sense based off of, if we can think back to how women and men operate, women were meant to be more nurturers right. and men were meant to be more hunter and gatherers and have more of a state of resilience kind of built into them. Yeah, I do. I mean, it's interesting. So I looked up the definition of sympathetic nervous system. They were talking about the sympathy for other organs, which I didn't quite understand. Mm -hmm. Because the way that I was thinking, so man has to be able to chase antelope, right, whatever. So that sympathetic nervous system needs to get going. Mm -hmm. So if you're always calm and collected, so nurturing, you think, is more parasympathetic mm -hmm. or, you know, vagal nerve, right? But if you look at the sympathetic nervous system in women, it's very interesting how it's how it's evolved, what does it do? And then there was an interesting article in Italy in 1972, they took women who had uh, abnormal periods. Mm -hmm. They could not get pregnant, right? So they took 100 of them, 50 of them had cellular ganglion block, the other 50 didn't. The one who got the block, half of them got pregnant. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It makes sense because of the uh, connection between the HPA axis and female hormones. Right, and, and sympathetic. And huge root cause, yeah. And even with my story, so that was the root of a lot of my problems, really at the core. So, right, I was put on all these medications right. and they wanted to cut out my large intestine. And that's what kind of catapulted me down this road of doing a lot of the deeper healing work, finding right. functional medicine, taking the root cause approach. and doing microbiome testing. I found out that I had SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And right. I did a lot of protocols for that, right? We talked about this on our curve of the, the, the herbals. I did the leaky gut right. repair stuff and I would get better, then I would relapse and I'd get better and I'd right. relapse. And I was one, just already excited that I was making progress because here I was from the point of almost having my large intestine removed. And even when I tell that story, I, I share that like I was ready. I was so ready to get that surgery. And so was, move on. Yeah, I was that desperate. So I get with other people who are really struggling emotionally, physically, you'll do whatever to try to feel better so you can move on with your life. Um, but I set a timeline for myself. I'm like, all right, let me try all of these alternative methods right. first. And um, as I continued to relapse and I started to really get into the root cause, which for me, it's what is the root cause of the root cause? The root cause isn't the SIBO. It isn't the bacteria overgrowth. It's a it's, symptom. Yes, it's part of the symptom. It was what led to that in the first place. And for me, it was a lot of my core trauma and a lot of my own metabolic stressors that I was under. I mean, if one physician would have just looked at my lifestyle, I mean, I was at 10% body fat. Right. I was competing in all these competitions. So there was the metabolic stress and how that has an impact on the body's nervous system, right? Cortisol is going to be chronically elevated quite a bit. There's blood sugar imbalances. I remember at that time I would get so many blood sugar drops, right? Because I didn't have that much fat. Well, you had body. no fat and you had, even well, the fat is really not uh, where sugar came from, but glucagon, right? So Correct. Yes. Glycine. Um, what's interesting, so... If you think of thinking standard, like I was trained to be standard. I finished medical school in 84 in Northwestern, mm -hmm. so fine medical school. We had half an hour on nutrition. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, nutrition. And then I had problems with my intestines for 10 years. I found a guru in New York who was pretty, I think, bad. But, you know, 
at least he was looking at that space. Mm -hmm. So he was the one who started me thinking about checking my gut and all this. And I had SIBO and yeah. I had leaky gut. I had all of that. All so that, I'm yeah. happy to say my uh, last GI map test is completely normal now. All right. Let's go. Only three months of antibiotics. Okay. Yeah. Like, you know, pharmaceutical for one yeah. month of biologicals, mm -hmm. antibiotics, and all of that. But now it's like normal. And now it's normal. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, that's it's like, incredibly common, right? And if you actually look at the, the symptoms, like if you were to pull open symptoms of IBS, right? Chronic bloating, mm -hmm. constipation, diarrhea, and you pull up the symptoms of SIBO, they're literally identical. And I think they've shown that it, even up to 80% of people who have IBS actually have SIBO. Of course, there's other reasons for IBS, right? right? Well, there are, of course, there Food are three different SIBO. Yeah, but SIBO, the gut microbiome just plays such a huge role. And that's where- Oh yeah, overgrowth. The other thing is I, I found I had amoeba. Yeah, oh, you did? Yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. You think I but my like my all my other factors were totally normal. Have yeah. you heard the term uh Harvard death? Have you heard that term? Heart over death. Harvard death. Like Harvard, Harvard. University. Uh -huh. Death. Harvard death. Uh-huh. It means when the patient's dead, but all the numbers are normal. Mm. Right. So all my lab numbers were perfect. Mm -hmm. But until you look in the gut, you really don't know. Yeah. So that this is actually a great lead in. I mean, we can, we can geek out about this forever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to bore the audience. But one of the things I think I'm very interested in developing is pre-care and after care for PTSD. Mm -hmm. well, we're going to use, um, just so you know, my objection to term PTSD is going to be extending, but we'll just use it simplicity. So we, you, I was very intrigued of you talking about various probiotics or probiotics for life. It doesn't have to be biotic, it could be fungal, right? Yeah. Um, to have cognitive impact. Mm -hmm. So what have you learned, do you think? What can you share with me and the audience? Yeah, um, there's a new area of research called psychobiotics, right? Perfect so term. Biotics, bacteria, right. or different microbes that right. can really impact our mental health through the right. impact on the vagus nerve and the gut brain axis, which for everyone listening, the gut brain axis is really just the bi-directional communication between the brain and the gut. Right. And um, they call it the third brain, right? The third or brain. second brain, whatever. Yeah. Third brain actually. And each of these different probiotics, which a lot of the research is done on strain specific probiotics. Right. So if you go to CVS or the pharmacy and you pick up, you know, a, a general probiotic, you're probably not going to get a lot of the benefits of... Probably has nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much sure. Yeah, but the research is really astonishing. You know, they've done research for depression, for stress response. They've done research on helping people who struggle with insomnia and sleep. And even some of it they've shown when somebody was on an SSRI and then paired even with a psychobiotic, their reduction in depressive symptoms was increased exponentially. And uh, I'll even pull up a little bit of research here that I cool. have. Um, some and of the, if you can just take a picture of the screen, we'll post it out for people. Yeah, so psychobiotics. Including me, I'll be the one reading it too. <laughs> yeah, in, in the clinical definition, so psychobiotics are a group of probiotics that affect the central nervous system, right? And why I think this is so astonishing is because it goes along with everything that you do. You're impacting the central nervous system through right. these different blocks and that's impacting one's mental health but how these impact the gut brain axis is through the immune system and then also through different metabolic pathways right and ultimately this can lead to antidepressant and antipsychotic effects and some of the strains that i've seen some research on is bifidobacterium longum so they're very specific strains right. And this strain in particular has been shown to support cortisol levels and reduce perceived stress uh, in people. So what they've done actually a few different studies, um, uh, four week studies on people and they measured and they had an increase in beta two brainwave activity at rest compared to the placebo group. Beta two, I'm not really familiar with it. I know alpha and beta, but I don't know beta two. Okay. Yeah. I and do it. ultimately, their stress response and impact on the HPA access was right. reduced. greatly reduced. So it helped a lot with sleep. It helped a lot with anxiety levels. 
some of the other research is on uh, the strange Lactobacillus planetarium. Right. And that the, seems to have a lot of. You seen that effect. one before? I've seen it across the board of different things. The thing I found also interesting: there was a probiotic that's liquid. Um, it's from England. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It helped uh, Parkinsonism, hmm. which is like what? That's crazy because yeah. a, lot, a lot of you think it's true that a lot of the brain transmitters are generated in the gut, yeah. and then they brought up. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, as you said, it's bi directional. It's one of the things that people might not realize that the reason people call the gut second brain or third brain is that comes from research. My wife, you know, just shows how crazy our conversations can be sometimes. So it depends how many neurons you have. Mm -hmm. So the brain, like our brain, have multiple millions of neurons. Heart has uh, 50, I think, million neurons, and the gut has 30 million neurons. Mm -hmm. So when you see danger and your gut goes in spasm, it's not just the brain is doing it, the neurons are mm -hmm. somehow connected to the other brain and goes, whoa, something bad's going on. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole connect, there's nerves, and the nerves can go back and forth, which mm -hmm. is really crazy. Yeah. And also, too, a lot of these different uh, microbes in our guts, right, they are acting on the vagus nerve. Correct. And um, That's a parasympathetic system, which is the opposite yes. of sympathetic, right? Yes, so it's helping bring the body back into more of that rest right. or that digest state. So we've seen for people who have low diversity in their guts or they have bacteria dysbiosis or imbalance, um, right. they can have poor vagal tone and this can greatly impact their mental health. But then... So we look at the bacteria in the gut, right? And this area of research is really incredible. There's a lot of different um, strains of psychobiotics, I think. Yeah, if you could send it, uh, I'd like to review it. If yeah, you don't mind. there's a, a few different ones, too, that they've shown that app, act on GABA receptors quite a bit. So, you know, I'm still even diving into a little bit of the research myself on, like, which strains to use in particular Wait, maybe in which we can scenarios. combine our efforts. Yeah. Well, GABA, just for those people who are not necessarily into the English. GABA is where alcohol works and valium works, mm -hmm. all of that. So yeah. if you think about it, you drink alcohol, you're going to be chilled out. Mm -hmm. So if you activate your GABA, which, which are the mechanisms, either valium or alcohol or probiotic, mm -hmm. that's going to keep you calm, mm -hmm. which is a nice thing without frying your liver like you will with alcohol. Yes, 100%. And even um, with women that we work with a bit in my practice too, like hormonally looking at a lot of this, if they're mm -hmm. low in progesterone, uh, we also can see an increased impact in uh, their mental health, right? Because progesterone right. also acts on GABA receptors in the brain. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so progesterone we call nature's Xanax. So for a lot of women who are dealing with... It's fascinating. Uh, Depression and a lot of mood trouble sleeping, right? Because right. GABA is important for that. Um, right, right. They could actually be low in their progesterone levels. And this is also too um, where women during different phases of their cycle can have a lot of different impacts on the mood. Right. Quite a bit. Yeah, the cycle is a, to me is just a fascinating physiological change. It's incredible. And you know, most of the research, though, they've done up until more recently has either been on men or postmenopausal women. They in, 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 in a lot of the medical research. Oh, well, that's true. Um, they I now are doing more on cycling women, but they literally would look out women in, who are cycling and say, this is too complicated right. because of the ebbs and the flows and the changes. So right. they wouldn't. It's a different physiological system. Yeah, so even things like antidepressants, different medications, Blood pressure. Um, women can be definitely impacted differently, even when we look at some right. of the studies, um, because they didn't take into account women who have hormones that are cycling. It's funny, so my wife used to tell me that for years, and I was like, yeah, whatever. Uh, but I actually absolutely believe it. I looked at the studies, and it's, well, the technical logic would be that it is that you want to have homogeneous group, mm -hmm. all men. And then the same thing goes, actually, there's further breakdown. So there is white man, black man, uh, Asian man, all of that. There, is a, there are differences. There are significant amount of differences in tolerating alcohol, tolerating mm -hmm. this, tolerating that. So hopefully we're getting there, and research is starting to get there. But it's, I think we'll be able to handle it. But the whole concept of God is being 
still something went wrong, yes. which is really interesting to watch for me. And the only reason I got into it is because I had problems. Yes, that's exactly what like, I got into it. I always tell people I would not be as obsessed with gut health if it wasn't for like it feeling like it literally saved my life. And as I healed my gut, you know, a lot of my depression, a lot of my mental health issues did improve to an extent, right? For a lot of my life, I struggled with some of my own nervous system dysregulation. And that's why I've been so passionate about the the healing work in, well, in hopefully general. Hopefully will help regulate today. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's part of the plan. <laughs> yeah. But I think um, in terms of, helping people with PTSD, I think if you can really combine both of these things, right. like we can work on the gut microbiome, right? If somebody yep. has dysbiosis, overgrowth of bacteria, yep. uh, parasites, fungal overgrowth, if they have leaky gut, getting that healed using things like psychobiotics. And now you combine that with yeah. A lot of the work that you're doing, I feel like the results are going to be should tenfold. be synergistic. Yeah. yeah, it really should be synergistic. You know what I find the most interesting, yeah, which is it sounds woo woo, but you know, hopefully I love I'm woo-woo. about science. Yeah. I like woo. But you know, it's like well, it's woo woo now. It's like they say advanced science looks like magic. Yes. Okay, uh, whatever. So I think this is like woo woo now is going to be advanced science mm-hmm. in ten years. But the whole concept candidate candidiasis, mm-hmm. overall of Canada, you know, it's much more common in women, blah, blah, blah. But I find it interesting that it gives you, it's such a smart little beastie. It makes you want to eat more sugar, mm-hmm. which if you think about it, how did they become such an amazing parasite? It sucks up all your sugar. It makes you feel dizzy. You have to eat more sugar and grow more Canada which is amazing to me mm-hmm. that that's a single cell organism, not like it has a brain and has a plan, mm-hmm. it just does what it does. So the whole concept is, even though it's small, I wouldn't underestimate it. Yeah. Have you ever seen the Netflix film, Fantastic Fungi? <laughs> yes. It's fantastic, <laughs> all right. It's yeah. fantastic, all right. It's so interesting, right? No, they're, they're amazing how they, what they do. But they that. overtake. They definitely they overtake. They do everything, yeah. yeah. Biology, I mean, it's like it's been successful. I think we live in such a sterilized environment. We forgot what yeah. real environment is. But my honeymoon was um, in Kathmandu and Tibet. So talk about being in nature. So at one point, I was covered in leeches and all this. Like, you go out in nature. Nature reminds you, you're not yeah. the man. It's yeah. like, yeah, you, know, you, you ain't the man. Yeah. It's like nature is in charge. Maybe that's where I got my amoeba. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, we see them all the time. In our amoeba. Practice. They're, well, that's just weird. parasites, overgrowth, yeah. all, all different types, right? And yeah. um, it definitely scares you a little bit. Like when I travel to Europe and yeah. like undercooked meat, like I, I love sushi. And then well, I, now I'm like, no, uh-huh. I, I don't anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen way too much. I, I hope you got in uh, my practice. Your, do you have, uh, you had hepatitis A vaccine? Uh, I honestly highly can't, get it. I can't remember. I definitely get it because, like, there was a um, breakout a number of time in uh, New Orleans mm. from clams. You can get it from clams. Mm. Interesting. So if you like that kind of stuff, get it. That you should get a vaccine for for sure. Yeah. Okay. Totally Great. consider it. Um, anyway, um, so I think we need to go do some work, like to help you. It should be lovely. Um, so in summary. Um, thank you for coming. Yeah. Really appreciate it. I think uh, maybe you can come back later and tell us how everything, what kind of effect you had. Like, it'll be interesting to see tomorrow how you feel. Yeah. Uh, we can see, I mean, hopefully you got us perfect now. Uh, maybe it'll be yeah. more perfect. I don't know. Yeah, I think there's normal things that can set it off, but it's, right. it's not what it. But it's interesting. Used we also be. use stellate like uh, severe pain from period. Right. Yeah. Think about why that happens. For painful periods. Yeah, painful periods yeah. and mood swings. Yeah. Right. PMDD. So, right. We, we, we treated it. that. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. So to me, when the sympathetics is out of whack, it's hard. Mm-hmm. Right. And you don't know who goes through that. Who, who needs that? Yeah. So. I think it's really powerful work for sure. Yeah. Um, the last point I'd even share on like the, the gut microbiome, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Kenneth Brown, who is a physician, no. he came on a podcast 
a few years ago, but he was in the, the front end research on SIBO. He developed a product called All Client Teal, which is a polyphenol blend, um, which polyphenols are really powerful for uh, modulating the gut. They work hmm. a bit like a prebiotic, but they're not fiber based. Um, so there's things like resveratrol, um, corbacho is a type of a polyphenol that you've right. heard of. Turmeric, turmeric is a polyphenol, cacao. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, of course I know turmeric. But they work incredible for increasing diversity in the gut. So his his product is geared towards uh, bringing down methane predominant SIBO um, by use of polyphenols. But that makes sense. I share this because um, he talks quite a bit about also leaky gut and right. how a leaky gut actually leads to a leaky brain as well. Absolutely, that and makes sense. The it's the similar to the blood by day. You know, it's interesting. So just a cautionary tale. So I'm into longevity yeah. quite a bit. So I had my biological clock tested. So I'm 66 now, chronologically. I need to get mine tested. I can get it done for you. Yeah? The best one is grim age. How, how young can you be? I wouldn't do it before 40. No, but how young can the age go down to, like, your chrono? Can they test it? I can test the... I can ask my friends like, about it. Could you be like five? No. No? I don't think you can do that. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I don't think. I hope not. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm 53 yeah. chronologically, uh, okay. biologically. Um, but what's interesting is so reservatory. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was following David Sinclair's work a lot of it. And he talks about one gram per day. That's amazing. All of that. There's a lot of studies that high level reservatory will cause Alzheimer's. Really? It can lead to Alzheimer's. Hmm. You I think how that scary reason. that is? Yeah. There's a lot of it there. Really? I, I didn't everything. Yeah. But there's a lot there. So, oh, so you don't I would it. say resveratrol. No, I just toss all of it out. Really? I need Gone. to look into that research. I don't take resveratrol currently right now. But my point is, yeah. I'd be curious to see how much resveratrol is in those pills. Yeah. Um, his, does David Sinclair no, work? his doesn't have resveratrol in it. It's a mm -hmm. corbetcho. Good. Um, but just sharing resveratrol is a type of polyphenol. That yeah, okay, I got research it. on for the gut. Yeah, I got it. Because that was David Sinclair's work, but it was interesting. It was done on mice. Ah. And I have a, what happens in to the liver is different than the mouse and yeah. the human. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. Because resveratrol is like the best thing for aging. Yeah, don't take I, it. I've heard a lot about that. Don't I've take heard it. People talk about don't it. Don't take yeah. it. Yeah. Huh. No. All right. Anyway, off we go. Off we go. All right. Thanks. Hopefully, it's easy for you. All right.